It was at Oddstock Hospital that Ian began to rebel against the gloomy prognosis of the doctors. Oddstock was where I started to learn to control what I had and, and to temper my attitude towards disability and towards myself and towards those around me. We've certainly had plenty of people who've lost sensation in part of the body, like after a nerve injury. What we hadn't had before was someone where the, the whole body, uh, from the neck downwards, was insensitive. Um, and that created problems because there wasn't a, a, a single part of him which, uh, which uh, moved under full control. When he first came to us, he was in a wheelchair and had enormous difficulty even standing up. I fought long and hard not to go into a wheelchair. And I was arrogant and I was bloody minded and I was awful and difficult. I was a very difficult patient and it, it worries me that they remember me so well. I must have been really difficult. Um, but this is where a lot of it happened. And in the wards that we'll go into in a little while. He probably was very angry with what had happened to him. And I think he used to get angry with us because we couldn't really understand him uh, as far as he could see. The trouble was that Ian's nerves were so badly damaged that no one at Oddstock really knew how to help him. It was going to be up to him. He wasn't paralyzed. He could move his limbs. But without proprioception, he just couldn't tell them what to do. Ian was determined to walk again. He knew he could never rebuild his damaged nerves, so somehow he would have to bypass them. If he was to regain any control over his limbs, he had to forge a new link between mind and muscle. But how? The first big thing was to try and, to try and get myself to sit up, but it's, it's difficult now to remember exactly how it was and to, to portray that. It's like trying to remember how you used to tumble when you were a child. I tried to learn to sit up for days, weeks, and I had terrible tummy pains and pulled muscles, sort of, it felt like, and it was exceedingly frustrating. I've been sitting up all my life until that point, and suddenly I was deprived of the simple act of just sitting up. Eventually, Ian began to sense that the solution might lie in some hidden part of his mind. He had a hunch that if he could visualize a movement, he might, by sheer force of concentration, make his body perform it. I remember tensing very, very much the tummy muscles and, and just sort of sitting up and I would fold up in the middle and just never get anywhere. But after a lot of practice and a lot of, uh, a lot of effort, I actually learned this technique to just sort of like lift the head, move the shoulders forward and sit up. I remember vividly the first time I sat up, I was so euphoric. I lost all control and, and, and almost fell out the bed again because I just lost control about keeping the tummy muscles tight and all that sort of thing. And that simple act of sitting up in bed was the key um, to how movement was going to have to be if it was going to be controlled for the rest of my life, that I would have to plan it before I did it, that I'd have to structure it in my mind and work my way through it. And that's how it is today. It hasn't changed. Ian now set himself a punishing regime of rehabilitation. Painstakingly, he analysed each movement, working out which muscle was doing what, and the effect of each action upon his balance. Then, with iron discipline, he repeated each element over and over, day after day, until his body obeyed him. And this was just the start. His condition meant that no movement would ever again be automatic. From now on, every single action would have to be plotted. When you stop and think what he has to do, every minute of the day, he's, you know, he's got to think. Like us, like you're sitting there and I'm sitting there, if I want something over there, I'll just do that. But Ian can't. He's got to think. And that's every minute of his life, sort of thing. He would not get in a wheelchair, because he always said he'd walk. 
always determined to walk. And walked he did, but he shook a lot of people. Because we never thought he'd walk. I was told he wouldn't walk again. And he was determined not to be left on the side like a cabbage. It was to take Ian four months to learn to put a sock on. And a year to stand safely. If Ian's first breakthrough was this huge mental effort, using powers of visualization and analysis he had never dreamt of, the second was the direct use of his eyesight. Ian realized that to keep control of his movements, his eyes would now have to tell his brain what his limbs were doing. I could move my hands a bit, but only if they were in vision. Um, and I could control them if I could see them. But as soon as I looked away, they would float off and they would do really strange things. I remember people would sit beside of me and I'd be turning to someone on the other side of the bed and the arm would wander off and hit someone or it would knock something off the cabinet. But it was very frustrating. I just wasn't aware of it, these things happening, you know. But if I could look and see my hands, I could control them. And it was this sudden realisation as things developed that I had to look at everything to control it. Ian's need to see gives his movement its distinctive character. When walking, he tips his head forward so that he can see his feet, watching his legs like a hawk so as not to lose control of the knee joints. But being freed from a wheelchair wasn't enough. There was another whole dimension of movement which Ian had lost. Gesture. Looking natural was so vital to him that he now became obsessed with learning to gesture again. By monitoring it in peripheral vision all the time. Certainly I can remember with my hands, um, working for hours, days, weeks, months with them to make sure that they weren't wandering and I wanted them to, to control them precisely. And you just go over things again and again and again until you build up a, um, the pattern of movement that you want. You know, His um, gestures which had once been spontaneous, were now carefully choreographed. The rest of his life would be a kind of performance. You, know, you need that drive and that pull to, to, to get you through it. 